Before I do start this video, make sure to use my TCG player affiliate down below if you're looking for any of these singles that I talk about today. Also, this channel is sponsored by Arcane Fortress. If you're looking for the best deck boxes around, make sure to use my link down below in the description to check them out. One other way you can support the channel is by becoming a patron. There are some great benefits of being a patron to the channel, such as giveaways, deck advice, and more when you do join. Hey, what's going on YouTube? This is Devin coming back at you with another video today in Pub Stomp MTG. And in this video today, I will be focusing on a pretty crazy and wild looking commander called Felix Five Boots. And the reason why I call it that is mainly because, I mean, just look at him. He has five boots, of course. He also does have a lot of weapons stabbed into him that he could pull out at any time. Instead of having the holster, he is the holster, basically. And so let's first dive into this commander and see what he does before diving into the deck tech. So Felix Five Boots does read for two black, green, and a blue. It's a ooze rogue for a 5-4 body. Does have menace and ward 2. If a creature you control dealing combat damage to a player causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So this is pretty powerful. There's a lot of abilities that you can abuse with a specific commander with Felix 5 boots. But I will say it's very similar to a lot of your normal panharmonicon abilities where it just doubles the triggers. But I will say this is at least a little bit more rewarding in the way that you have to deal combat damage to a player in order to get an additional trigger. Otherwise, you would just have like a panharmonicon on the battlefield and an ETB trigger. You don't really have a lot of work compared to the other way. So for me personally, this is a little bit more rewarding in that aspect and it, you kind of go into a little bit of an aggro shell with the Sultai stuff which I do find very interesting and there's a lot of cards that we can take advantage of in this deck and so let's get right into it. So what's very nice about Felix's ability is the fact that permanents you control will trigger an additional time when you deal combat damage. So that's any permanent on the battlefield, not just the permanent that you are dealing with combat damage with, like a creature for example. So there are absolutely so many effects that you can take advantage of, especially with the coastal piracy effects. So the coastal piracy effects basically have that option of whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you draw a card. There are a lot of these effects that we can take advantage of, especially in these color combinations with the Indomitable, Reconnaissance Mission, and Biden of Thassa. These all basically have that effect whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you draw a card. So let's just say Say if you swing in with five creatures and you have Felix on the battlefield, you connect with all of them. Instead of drawing five cards, you will draw ten cards with Felix. Obviously, the more effects you do have on the battlefield like this, the more card draw you are going to get, and it's going to be absolutely absurd. We do also have the creature forms of this specific kind of spell, like Oron Frostfang and Toski Bearer of Secrets. These provide a little bit more than the previous other versions, maybe besides Biden of Thassa tapping a creature. However, Oron Frostfang is going to be incredible in this deck specifically because attacking creatures you control have death touch that's perfect in this deck because of course we want to deal combat damage and the opponents will have the tough decision of either blocking with a creature and that creature dying or letting us go in with some card draw and of course with Toski, it's just indestructible and it does attack each combat that's very minuscule because it does have indestructible there are some other similar creatures for example gix yagmoth predator and edric spy master of tress i don't like these as much because your opponent can potentially get a card draw off of them but the fact that your opponents are attacking each other tapping their creatures so that they swing in for some combat damage and get some card draw will make our situation much better because we could swing in maybe be uncontested because all their creatures are tapped and they get more card draw because of course ours will trigger twice theirs will only trigger once i did also want to touch on the sword cycle because technically they will trigger when we deal combat damage to a player to trigger twice the swords that i personally like the most in this deck is sword of feast and famine sword of wealth and power sword of forge and frontier and sword of hearth and home first of all sword of feast and Famine is going to be incredible in this deck because whenever a creature deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card and you untap all lands you control. So instead of once, you will trigger that twice. Unfortunately, triggering our lands will not be too beneficial because of course we are going to be in combat and we're going to lose all that mana if we do tap, then untap, then tap, then untap. But most likely, our coastal piracy effects will be on the battlefield where we could draw a lot of cards and we want to have a lot of mana available ready to use so that we could cast more spells. And of course, with Sword and Wealth and Power, it is a newer 
favorite card on this list. So this card is absolutely nuts. I think it's one of the better swords that you can be playing in the entire deck, mainly because equipped creature gets plus two, plus two, and it has protection from instant and sorcery spells. So say goodbye to your opponents trying to target removal uh, your creature because sword of wealth and power is going to be attached to it. Plus what's really good about it is the fact that it could ramp ahead with some treasure tokens and it could copy some spells that you cast that turn. Plus I think it's really cool that we have a Ruhan little Easter egg on the art. So I did also want to focus on the early game because of course there's a lot of early game creatures that we can take advantage of when they deal combat damage to a player. So for example I absolutely love the new Tiny Bones the pickpocket mainly because it's just one black mana for a death touch 1-1 one, one. and it does have the ability when it deals combat damage to a player you may cast a target non-land permanent card from that player's graveyard and mana of any type can be spent to cast that spell. So this in the early game you can play turn one and if somebody for example plays rampant growth and just decides to ramp ahead and has the rampant growth in their graveyard we could swing at that specific person so that we could just basically cast that rampant growth so that we could ramp a little bit ahead too. Of course that could be a very specific early game example but I do like the fact that this can scale the later the game goes on. Of course most people may just block into this but I do feel like again this can be a threat on the table in early or late game. Another great early game engine is Deep Root Wayfinder, mainly because when it deals combat damage to a player or battle, you surveil one, then you may return a land card from your graveyard to the battlefield tap. So what you can do is just when you deal combat damage, if you surveil and there's a land on top of your library, you could just put it into your graveyard and then just put that land onto the battlefield tap. So this is a perfect early game ramp option. And of course, if we do have a commander on the battlefield, we, we could surveil two and then potentially put two lands on the battlefield. I also do think Archmage's Newt is absolutely adorable. I mainly like it for the yard, but it does have a good combat trigger, basically being a Snapcaster Mage. So whenever it deals combat damage to a player target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard, gains flashback until on a turn. The flashback cost is equal to its mana cost, but if you did saddle uh, Archmage's new, uh, it'll become zero instead of uh, the mana cost. I did want to briefly mention some all-stars at the beginning of the game. For example, Psychic Frog, it's not technically out because it's coming out in Modern Horizons 2, but it's such a great shoe-in. There is also Glissa Sunslayer and Drana Liberator of Malakir. Each of these are pretty incredible. I do specifically like Psychic Frog, mainly because it's a frog. I absolutely love frogs. But of course, it deals combat damage. You will draw a card. And you can discard a card and put a 1-1 counter on it to make it a bigger threat. And then we could exile cards in our graveyard to give it flying until on a turn. So it's evasive. It could grow bigger. And also, it could draw cards. What more do you want? And with Glissa, you do have the option when you deal combat damage to a player to draw a card and lose one life, destroy target enchantment, or remove up to three counters from target permanent. I will be honest, that last option probably won't come up as much but it does have the great utility of those first two options so what a great card in the deck just to double those triggers with our commander and of course what's very neat about drana liberator of malakir is the fact that it is three mana it does have flying and first strike first strike is the most important ability on this factor mainly because when you deal combat damage to a player you put a one one counter on each attacking creature you control so with the first strike damage happening first you will swing it with drana and with all your other creatures because it deals first strike damage it'll put one one counters on each of your creatures before your other creatures deal combat damage and if you do have your commander, you'll just put two 1-1 counters on each creature. So this seriously could up the ante on the power of all our creatures on the battlefield. So now let's focus on the game warping combat triggers that we could absolutely take advantage of. Of course, we are in Soul Tide color combination, so there's so many options of where we could choose from. First up, I do want to mention Ohir Castellan, Deepest Growth. This basically has the crazy ability to reveal the top card of your library depending on how much combat damage you deal with Ohir Castellan. And cheated a big, giant, scary threat on the battlefield. Of course, with our commander, we could do that twice so this is extra deadly in our deck next up i do want to talk about the get rog ravenous ride we won't be able to really double this trigger of sacrificing a creature because we already sacrificed it the first time however it does provide really good utility depending on how big of a creature we do have on the battlefield and of course, we do have a little bit of a sub theme of what plus one plus one counter. So this could be absolutely ridiculous drawing a bunch of cards and also putting a lot of lands on the battlefield, depending on how much uh, cards we do sacrifice with it. Plus, it just gives me another excuse to put a frog friend in the deck because I absolutely love frogs. Following that, I do believe Hydra Omnivore is absolutely going to be nuts, not for the person that you're dealing combat damage to, but for each other opponent that is going to be taking the damage. So Hydra Omnivore does read whenever it deals combat damage to an opponent, 
opponent, it deals that much damage to each other opponent. This may bring up a funny situation with your opponents begging you, each one of them, to swing at them personally, mainly because you're only going to deal 8 damage to that one that you do swing with. But of course, if you do have your commander out on the battlefield, if you do swing at that one person, you're going to deal 8 damage to that opponent, but each other opponent is going to receive 16 damage because you're going to double that trigger of dealing combat damage. This is really just going to provide a funny politics situation where your opponent's going to be like, pick me, pick me, don't pick the other people. I don't know why it's just so funny that way. But I do personally think another great card you can take advantage of is Old Nabo. And this is ridiculous because I feel like personally it should be a red card in my opinion. It does have the ability whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, create that many treasure tokens. So let's just say you swing in with Felix and also Old Nabo and swing in with 12 total power. You connect with both of them. Instead of making 12 treasure tokens, you're going to be making 24 treasure tokens. So we all know how busted Old Nabo is, but it's going to be even more busted in this deck specifically. There are some more dragons from Dungeons and Dragons that we can take advantage of, such as the Ancient series with Ancient Bronze Dragon, Ancient Silver Dragon, and Ancient Brass Dragon. The biggest downside that I have come across with these dragons is the fact that if you roll a low number, you're not going to really get too much value out of them. But the fact that you could basically double that combat trigger of each of them with our commander will give us an extra chance if we do roll low the first time, we could potentially roll a high number the next time. And I mean, each of them, if you do connect with them and you get double the triggers, it's most likely going to spell game over with each of them, especially with Ancient Silver Dragon. It's probably my favorite out of the series, mainly because when you roll a D20, you draw cards equal to the result. So for example, if you draw like five cards the first time, you could have the chance to re-roll and potentially draw 20 cards the next time. And of course, with Ancient Bronze Dragon, you could buff up a lot of different creatures on the battlefield double time with your commander, and you could reanimate a lot of different creatures with Ancient Brass Dragon. So quite possibly, these are probably one of the best cards you can be playing in the entire deck, at least in my opinion. However, that's going to do it for me, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming by and watching this video on Felix 5 Boots. Again, this is going to be very powerful for the fact that you could just double the combat triggers of your creatures. And of course, a lot of commander players love their Panormonicon abilities. To me personally, I feel like they're going a little overboard. I made a video a long time ago about uh, how last year made a lot of Panormonicon abilities staple to creatures or other effects. So make sure you check out that video just to see how I feel about the situation. I do feel like, again, Felix is a little bit better in those instances because you kind of have to earn those combat triggers compared to just ETB strategies. But let me know down below in the comments what are your thoughts and opinions. I'd love to hear feedback from you. Also, make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. And with that out of the way, thank you for stopping by.